Good morning. Scripture reading today is in Mark 8, 17 through 21. <clears throat> Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are, you, are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see? And ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. Then he said to them, do you still not understand? So bet. So I did forget one other announcement. There is a verse by verse, word by word, however you want to say it, um, Lionsgate made films for the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Um, the same actor portrays Jesus. Mark, of course, is the shortest gospel, so it's going to be your shortest movie. You can read through the Gospel of Mark in less than an hour and a half, and that's about what this movie is. Friday night, 6 o'clock, we'll have dinner here, and after that, roughly about 7, we'll start the movie for anyone who wants to come. Amen. Friday night, okay? All right, we'll start with prayer, and then we're going to dig into mostly Mark chapter 8. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that Jesus is the word, that the words are words of life. Contrary to any of the truths that we think that we know that are not really truths that are of this world. Lord, you love us and you want to bring us back into a right relationship with us. You want us to be your children that live for you, Lord. And Lord, that means we have to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow after Jesus. That we have to take ourselves off the throne, Lord, and put you on the throne where you belong. And it takes a daily correcting to do that, Father. Lord, we thank you that Jesus Christ gave up heaven and he didn't have the things on earth that we have, Father, and then laid down his life to save us. What an indescribable, unfathomable love that you have given for us, Father. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is called the Gospel of According to Mark, Part 2. And guess what? There's going to be a Part 3. And it's perfect because we're going to read through Mark chapter 16 on Thursday. And then you can see and read and hear all of your senses that God gives you on Friday if you want to come to the movie. I had Merle read from Mark 8, chapter 17 to 21, where Jesus is asking his disciples again, do you not understand? And if you didn't notice that, he didn't just say, do you not understand? He's like, do you not understand by now? You know, can you, can you not fathom these things? And the problem is, is because we are seeing and hearing and thinking everything physical rather than spiritual. How many of you here, you've, you have 20-20 vision without any kind of corrective lens? Ooh, a couple. All right. <laughs> How many of you are hearing is perfect without any corrective? Or you haven't lost any hearing. that You can, you can still hear those high frequencies you could when you're young? What? Wow. <laughs> what? Okay, we got a couple again. All right, now for you guys who raised your hands. <laughs> Do you use that hearing to hear? Yeah. And do you use that vision to see like you should? Oh, you stepped in that one, didn't you? Uh, what if I could give you corrective lenses or, or a hearing aid? Or better yet, I, could, I had the power to heal you. I mean, that's what Jesus did. He came to give sight to the blind. And he came to give hearing to the deaf. Will you use that to hear the words of Jesus? I mean, Jesus had to say to the churches after he left this world, do you hear? 
if you hear, hear and obey what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the churches. I am a spiritual being living in an earthly tent. Do you believe that? Paul says that we are. Or do I really believe because I don't understand because I'm not letting Jesus correct my vision and my hearing and I still continue to think that I am a physical being that will one day go to the spiritual. You know, a lot of people think that. One day I will go to heaven. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in Mark he said that our duty is to repent and believe the gospel, the good news, that Jesus Christ is the one who will make everything right, right with God. 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 1, this is from Saul, who would later be called Paul, who was destroying the church at first, and then if we look at Acts chapter 9, we see that he is converted because he sees and hears Jesus, and his life will never be the same. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 10, we read, For we know that if the early, earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Starts out with a prepositional phrase that ties the previous chapters together. And it says, we know. As believers, we know this. The problem is that so many times we know something, but still we act on something that we know is not true that money will satisfy our needs, our health will satisfy our needs, our grandchildren will satisfy our needs. <clears throat> Verse 2, meanwhile we groan. So is that what you're doing? Longing for heaven? Longing that your children know the gospel? The longing that even your enemies know the gospel? Meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed instead for our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked anymore. Remember back to the garden with Adam and Eve, and when they did sin, they found, they found themselves naked and felt shame. Do you feel shame with your sinful desires and stuff that probably still have an influence in your life? Verse 4, 4, we got a preposition again. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. That's what your life should look like now, that your spirit is dwelling with God's spirit, you're worshiping in spirit and truth, and this life is being swallowed up so that you don't have those desires anymore, so that you look towards the kingdom of heaven and build up treasures there instead of earthly treasures, so that you walk step in step with the Spirit. Verse 5, Now the one who is fashioned for us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not faith by sight. We are confident, because we know these things, we are confident then, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So, while we're still in the body, we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or whether we are away from it forever with Him. It is our goal to please Him. Verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now this is maybe Paul's final letter to a church that is struggling with the ways of the world versus the ways of the Spirit. They're still clinging to the ways that they used to live. They're still fighting with one another over who has the best spiritual gifts, and they're missing the gospel message. And this isn't 2 Corinthians, it's 2 Corinthians in our Bible, but Paul's had at least three or four different conversations with them by letter. And he continues to tell them, all these things that you think are important, let me show you a more excellent way. It's love. Love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son. It's about love. No greater love can a man have than to lay down his life for his friends. Even as I have loved, so you love. This is how you will be known, by your love, that you are my disciples. Love. So I have to ask you then, does eternity matter more to you than the here and now? 
because that's the problem with a lot of people. Whether it's the eyesight and the hearing that's bad or it's just the desires of the heart. If you're saved, you are a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Don't you see? Don't you hear these things? Don't you realize these things? How could you not see the miracle of the 5,000 or the miracle of the 4,000 and everything there? How can you not understand? Think about how frustrating that must have been for Jesus that day. I encountered Jesus, and I have to be honest, I see kind of, kind of click, blurry. It takes constantly, day to day, feeding on His Word, feeding on the Spirit, relying on Him in prayer, not, praying that not my will but His will, trusting Him even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I have to walk by faith, not by sight, and know that He works all things together for good for those who love Him. Acts chapter 9. We're going to read what happens with Saul and tie this together where we're at in Mark chapter 8 mainly. In Acts chapter 9, 1 through 18, remember that Saul has been destroying the church. Persecution breaks out <laughs> and the church spreads. All through Samaria, the half-brothers that they couldn't stand and even out into the desert to an Ethiopian eunuch and then back into Africa. Wow, who could have seen God doing these wonderful things that now we see clearly, 2020 hindsight, however you want to say it, what God was doing. Meanwhile, in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way the way that they lived their lives, not just proclaimed it, but lived differently from what they lived before because they were living for the future, their eternal future. The things of this earth didn't matter. And they had to tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one of God. Even though he had been crucified, they knew the truth and they knew that he would reign, that he would come again and he would bring his own unto them. So they were sheep that had to follow their shepherd. But Paul was trying to stamp them out, whether they were men or women in verse 2. He might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see anything. And Saul's that exception. He gets blinded so that he can see. <laughs> Usually Jesus is going and healing people and asking if they want their sight restored. Instead, Saul had to be blinded so that Jesus could heal him and see the truth. So they led him by the hand in Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on his name. That's what we see by sight, by physical sight, by physical hearing. And no way I want to bring Saul into my home. He will murder me and my family. But Ananias, even though he told the Lord stuff that the Lord already knew and this was his plan... He believed and obeyed, didn't he? Because it's hard to get past that seeing and hearing in this world and realize God has a bigger purpose and we have to walk by faith, not by sight. <clears throat> but the Lord said to Ananias, Go, 
This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to the kings and the people of Israel. I will show him. I will reveal it. That's why I have blinded him already. I will blind him so that I can heal him so that he can truly see. And what does, what does the Lord say next? How much he must suffer for my name. Now if you've read in Mark so far, you've seen Jesus presented differently than the other Gospels. Because like I told you before, Mark is writing to Romans, to Gentiles. He's not explaining Jewish heritage or anything else, and he's trying to combat what the world sees in Caesar as being their hope, their the gospel, their good news, the Savior who would unite the world and bring peace and prosperity. And he's presenting another gospel of this Jewish whoever that was murdered, so people think, that's the story, by the Romans. How could this be the Savior of the world? But remember how the gospel starts. He says this is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the Son, the Messiah of God. And that's it. He starts out this st statement that way. And we see as we're reading, Jesus is presented as what I'm going to say is a suffering servant. And his call for you is to suffer just the same. That's part of the gospel message. That's part of the good news. Remember when we went back into Acts and they were released from prison and they declared it to be a joy that they could suffer for Jesus? And that suffering does lead to bigger things than we could ever think about. But it's hard to say that suffering is something that I want to go through. And it's hard for us to even relate and what true suffering is because in this country we haven't felt that persecution. They're feeling it in other countries. I cannot imagine, but my heart does break in compassion. So I can give how I can give. I can pray how I can pray. I can do whatever the Lord leads me to do, but I can't fathom it because I haven't experienced that kind of suffering. And hopefully, honestly, come on, hopefully we don't in this country. But if we do, will we walk by faith instead of by sight? Will we realize where our hopes and dreams and peace really comes from rather than our comfort and security? I will show him how he must suffer for my name. And I believe it's in Mark 8 at the end of the chapter where Jesus says that we will suffer for his name and the gospel's sake. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, verse 17. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And look, Jesus is doing his work through his children, the church, his hands and feet, letting them be a part of this miracle, of this gospel presentation. Immediately, something like scales from Saul's eyes fell off and he could see again, he got up and was baptized. I was blind, but now I see. What does that remind you of, Barb? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. That song says a little bit, and Scripture says a little bit too, that that healing of blindness comes with our salvation experience too. Because we can't be saved unless we truly see that Jesus died for our sins. And I'm going to go on further and say, I don't know if you can be truly saved unless you realize Jesus is Lord. Because every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, not that Jesus is Savior, but Lord if Jesus is your Savior, He will be your Lord. But yeah, we need to correct our vision from time to time, more times than not. <laughs> Paul also wrote later in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 3, For though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world, on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Are they physical? 
No, of course they're spiritual. We demolish arguments and every pretension, pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That obedient life that we live, even a life of suffering because Jesus Christ is changing us, truly changing us from the inside out by His Word and by His Spirit. Boy, Paul sees things clearly when he's writing this letter to the Corinthians, doesn't he? But the problem is, like I said before, is the church still doesn't see it very well. If I could correct your vision where you could see Jesus clearly, would you let me? I can't do it. No, it's nothing with me. If Whoever could, if they offered you this, because it's Jesus working His miracle through His people, would you let them? Would you let Jesus change you? And then would you keep those glasses on or keep that vision corrected? What about when your eyes degrade and everything? Oh, we have surgeries if we need to to take the cataracts out or whatever it is, correct? So that we can see more clearly. What do we do if our hearing fails? Well, we get a hearing aid, right? He's not the only one. Because we realize those things matter. If they matter physical, how much do the more do they matter spiritually? Jesus said to the churches in Revelation, Who has ears? Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We don't hear that audibly. We hear that through God's Word, through prayer, through communion with, and fellowship with one another. The Gospel of Mark is written from the perspective that you have to answer these questions. It forces you, the reader, to do that. Who Jesus is to you. Maybe it's through the eyes of Peter and his declaration. Maybe it's whatever it is, but you are forced to answer the question, who is Jesus to me? And the answer is clear from Scripture that Jesus is Lord of all, or he's not. In Mark 8, verse 29, but what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answers that question. Anyone who believes has to answer that question. And maybe, just maybe, they'll be saved, period, with answering just that question. But maybe, maybe there'll be that day when many come to Jesus and say, we did mighty miracles in your name, and, and he says, depart from me, I don't know you. Now, here's a pause in the sermon a little bit. I know that some of you might have some questions about that verse compared to something you read in Mark if you did. Because in Mark, I don't remember which chapter now, 10, 11, there's a guy that's performing miracles and casting out demons. And the disciples say, do you want us to go stop him? And Jesus kind of says the opposite of what he says in Scripture before because he basically says if he's doing it, he's, he's with us. But Jesus said before, if he's not with us, he's against us, and not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Did you read that? You've got to question it. So if you have questions, discuss it. I'm here. Your, your, your peers and your, your friends and your believers are here. Don't just read over something and not comprehend it. The biggest compliment I can have is you come up and ask me what you did not understand from Scripture. I'm here for that, just so you know that. Now back to this. If you read the other Gospels, you know what Peter said. You know what even Jesus said. But here we only have a declaration that Peter says, you're the Messiah. We don't know from this that he has the words of life that they cannot walk away from. Where are they going to go? We don't know from reading this that many people deserted him after the feeding of the 5,000. All we know here is there's a question set before us, and this is the pivotal breaking point in Mark. Chapter 8 is all together, but chapter 8 and verses 29 to whatever verses they are where Peter makes that declaration is the dividing chapter between Mark presenting who Jesus is and presenting what it looks like to follow Jesus. Because of the passion that he laid out, what he did in his life, we will follow after him. We will be passionate and lay down our lives to save our friends if, in fact, we believe who Jesus is. 
I'll remind you of those words from Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. I cannot imagine that. You'll hear me say it over and over again because I cannot imagine as a shepherd leading sheep, and that's what the word pastor means, is a shepherd, that there are sheep out there who think they're sheep who aren't. And then the second thing that motivates me and stirs my soul is that sheep live a life where they're not really sheep. And then the day comes when you, maybe you get taken into the fold, but you say, man, I wish I would have done things differently. When all you need to do is open up your eyes, open up your ears, and let Jesus do whatever it takes. Will you let him spit on the ground and put mud in your eyes to let you see? Will you let him then correct your vision afterwards? It's a strange miracle that we get to there. It's not Jesus' power is any different. It's what the man needed to see happen. And was it what his disciples needed to see what happened? What we need to see what happens about correcting that vision. Because so many times we think we can see clearly. I realize I can't see as good as I do when I go out hunting. And you better be glad I realize that. Because if I didn't, what would I shoot by mistake? Vision's getting good enough with the road signs and things that, yeah, one of these days I'll have to break down and get some corrective lenses. But the thing that keeps me from doing it is my stubborn pride. Come on. All right. In Matthew chapter 16, we read this. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, blessed because of what you know you are blessed and in the right standing with God. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not to reveal to you with flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you, Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew's gospel compares it to the flesh and blood with the physical eyes so that we can see that. But Mark is writing what we see physical to get you to understand spiritual. Who is Jesus to you? And it requires an answer. Everyone answers that question whether you think you answer it or not. And you will be accountable on that day for the answer that you have made in your heart. Mark doesn't write these different things. But I have to answer the question, who do I say that Jesus is? If you remember also, John the Baptist even questioned, why would he not? He's in prison. He thinks Jesus, you have to go back and think about the way they thought the Messiah would be. They understood scriptures, <laughs> that the Messiah would come, right all wrongs, and that Israel would reign, and that is true. But it didn't happen when Jesus Christ came the first time. Jesus will reign on the throne of David, period. He will restore the kingdom of Israel. And Israel has come back from the four corners of the earth now. And if you read news and politics, you'll see how much Israel is involved even in these things that's going on in the Ukraine and stuff. But we're not here to talk about the world and news. We're here to hear what Jesus' words are. In Matthew chapter 11, after Jesus had finished, this is verse 1, instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, the deeds of the Messiah, the deeds of the chosen one, this is what Matthew writes, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus didn't look like who John necessarily thought he would look like. And the reason he didn't look as much like John thought was more because of John's circumstances. Woe me, Lord. These things are happening to me. I've had a life of prosperity, things good, and now I don't. No wonder it's harder for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven because he has to change the way he looks at things. You take someone else who has nothing and they're told about Jesus, they don't have as much to give up, do they? 
That's why the first part is deny yourself. That's from Mark chapter 8, if you haven't noticed that. Here's what Jesus replied. Go back and report to John whatever what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Because there's this thing with believing, and maybe the stumbling keeps you from believing, but there's also this thing of stumbling along the way as a believer because you're not letting correct your vision as needed. And as I've said, as needed is quite often with me. So I'm sure that that's similar with you. The blind are able to see so they can see spiritual truth. The lame walk so that they can go and follow Jesus just as Saul did and Ananias did. Those who have leprosy are cleansed because they couldn't go before. People would shun them away because they were in, uh, unclean. The deaf could hear. So now you could hear the words of God. And the dead are raised because guess what? You've been given new life in Christ. The old is dead and gone. And then what happens next in that? The good news is proclaimed to the poor, to those who I used to look down upon, but now I see a need for. And I don't mean just the poor. That's why I compared before the, the, the poor with the thief with myself. To anyone who is less than, the gospel needs to be preached to by those who have the freedom and the knowledge to do so. You've been given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Tell them about Jesus so you can release them from their bondage, their spiritual bondage. Have you seen the spiritual truths in reading that? Because they're all right here. And that's what Jesus's, Jesus told John's disciples and he went back and told John. And I guarantee you, without a doubt, that that gave John peace. He could die in peace then, knowing that Jesus did these things. He saw the spiritual reality of what Jesus was doing. In Mark chapter 8, we open with the feeding of 4,000. Why? Got to ask that question. We got the feeding of 5,000. The feeding of 4,000 is a less of a miracle, right? And we already had this one before, right? So why is it recorded here? And we can learn some more by reading another gospel. But a lesser miracle, and it's written down. Could Mark have placed this writing because it's inspired by God himself? It's spirit-filled, uh, God-breathed, and profitable for instruction, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfectly equipped, Right? I think it's pivotal. And like I said, it's to open up the eyes of the disciples. Will you let it open up your eyes? It's not about physical bread, and that's where I started. The, the, and Jesus is like, can you not understand? Do you not have ears and eyes that see and hear? If I am the Messiah, you've got to think beyond this physical world. And you've got to see your obligation to feed others with these spiritual truths. If we go back to John chapter 6 again at the feeding of the 5,000, we know that Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and that you have to feed on him. Some people that day probably even thought Jesus was talking about cannibalism when he's saying, feed on me. But regardless of what they thought, they didn't want to do it. That required too much. I believe I've been following Jesus, but Jesus tells him plainly the reason you're following me is because you want your physical needs met. M needs met. Not net needs, sorry. And they deserted him enough to the point where Jesus asked this question to the disciples then. But we've got to record it a little differently here. Jesus is the bread of life. He talks about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and how they thought that Jesus was talking about physical bread because the hypocrisy of the Pharisees is the blind leading of the blind because they don't understand these spiritual truths. 
You are to feed upon Jesus and give that bread of life to others. That's the good news. So can you see this? Can you see this clearly? Not just see it. Is there anything in your sight that needs correction? Compassion drove Jesus to feed these people again, just like compassion led him to in the first place. Physical bread to teach about spiritual bread. But so many of us only see the physical. The crowds came to have their physical needs met. In John chapter 6, as I was telling you when you read that, in verse 26 to 30, Jesus answered the crowd. He said, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Physical. Do not work for food that spoils. Physical. But for food that endures to eternal life. Spiritual which the Son of Man will give you, for on Him God the Father has placed His seal of approval. You see that by the miracles, by the fulfilled prophecy. Then they asked Him, what must we do? Because see, faith requires action, and James tells us that. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, and this alone, to believe in the One who sent me. That's John 6, 29. That's saving grace. Not by works of righteousness, but by believing in Jesus' name. But if you do believe, your eyes have been given sight, your ears have been opened up to hear, and you'll see that Jesus is the one who suffered and died for you, and he's calling you to spread that news and to live as he lived. Can you see this? Can you see it clearly? Or does your vision need to be corrected? So back to Mark chapter 8, verse 16. So they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. Aware of their conversation, Jesus asked them, Why are you debating about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Do you still have such hard hearts? Having eyes, do you not see? And ears, having ears, do you not hear? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of bro broken pieces did you collect? Twelve, they answered. You realize that's exactly enough to feed the 12 tribes of Israel? Did you see that at all? Because they would reject their Messiah so the, the God, good news would go out to the world. So th think about this miracle now and the feeding of the 4,000. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, seven's the number of completion of perfect perfect that goes into the, the Sabbath of rest on the seventh day. When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you collect? Seven. God will bring all the sheep into his fold. The children of Israel who rejected their Messiah and anyone who will hear the words of God, see the miracles, believe, and follow after him. They will all be brought into the fold. Then he asked them, do you still not understand? Jesus goes on to ask his disciples two questions. Who do people say that I am? That might be goats. We'll just leave it at people. And who do you say that I am? You know, that still might be some goats in the sheep pen. But the sheep follow the shepherd's voice. Peter makes his declaration, and you see that he doesn't make that many other statements invo in, uh, involving it. But G he presents Jesus as the suffering servant. Did Peter understand this? He understood enough of saving grace because Jesus told him clearly that that was revealed to him by God. But in Mark 8.33, and I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, we read these words of Jesus to Peter and to the disciples. Because you know they were thinking the same thing that Peter was just bold enough to say. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. That's the reason I chose the New Living Translation. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view. 
Peter made his declaration. Peter is saved by grace, but Peter still doesn't understand and needs his vision corrected. You see that all through the gospel, I mean, through the book of Acts. You see that continual correction, and you see that it comes from Stephen's and from Philip's. We need each other. It comes from Paul's and Barnabas's. Then Jesus clarifies Peter eventually with 2020 vision. And don't think that Peter didn't need to constantly rely on Jesus to keep that vision corrected all the time. If you read on in Mark 8, verse 34 to 38, then Jesus called the crowd along with his disciples because the invitation is to all of us. And he told them, if anyone wants to come after me, he must what? It's right there. That's the verse. That's it, right there on the wall. Deny yourself, because you can't do it if you don't deny yourself and your desires and your needs and the way you thought before, the way you saw before, the way you heard before. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. I got no idea what that means, Lord, but help me to have a spirit, a mind, a heart that is willing to follow you, whatever that means. I cannot conceive it, but I'm willing As you read along, you read the story about the young rich ruler who was not willing because of the things he had he didn't want to give up. Then come and follow me. And that following me is fishing for men. We know that from Scripture. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Verse 35. That's 34. Yep, you can see it at the bottom of the chair, not covering it. 35. 4, preposition Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But, complete opposite, whoever loses his life for me in the gospel will truly save it. You might have lost your physical life, but you will save your spiritual life for all eternity. And then Jesus goes on to say, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, no matter who you are, no matter what you have, and then forfeit your soul? Or, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? So, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. You know, when I've talked to Christians, I put quotations around that. I don't know whether they are or not. I know what they proclaim. And I hope and pray they are. But this verse so many times is used as a scapegoat reason. Because they say, I don't deny Jesus. Do you live for Jesus? Because if you're not living for Jesus, are you not denying Him? Do you take this verse wherever and I'm not trying to read more into it than there is or not? You have to answer these questions. I remember back when I was brought up in a Christian school and I remember that I didn't like proclaiming Jesus outside the Christian circles. When I was with public school friends, I was ashamed. That was obvious. But how many times in my life otherwise have I not brought up Jesus because, eh, I don't know, this is not the situation, whatever. But what is the Spirit prompting me to do? Oh, I didn't want to stop and help that guy because I didn't have time because I wanted to do... There's so many things that I have to, com- to contemplate. You have to decide for yourself who Jesus is to you. Who do you say that I am? If you didn't notice, I skipped a story in there. It's about a blind healing. It's in Mark 8, 17 to 28. Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear and don't remember? When I broke the five loaves to the 5,000 and how many basketfuls pieces you picked up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves from the 4,000, how many basketfuls or pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Now I'm putting that in front of it so that you understand this. They came to Bethsaida. Mark writes these words intentionally here, spirit breathe next. And some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. The blind man would not have found his way on his own unless his friends, Christian or unchristian, brought him to Jesus. He took the blind man by the hand, led him outside the village. Look at the compassion here. Look at how different this is from other miracles. 
When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus didn't have to do those things. We know that healing power came when he simply touched Jesus' robe, and we know that happened from the apostles as well. Jesus asked, Do you see anything? Hmm. You're like, what's he, that nut doing next? What do you see? And it's a handout, so make sure you sanitize your hands afterwards if you need to. What do you see? You've got to pass it. You've got to pass it because everybody's got to look at it. What do you see? I mean, you've got eyes to see, correct? I know you see something. You see something spiritual, don't you? You see Jesus, don't you? Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Was there not enough power from Jesus? Was his healing limited? Was the man's faith not enough? This is a strange miracle. And put right in the Bible where it's put. So he puts his hands on the man again. There you go. There you go. What do you see? <laughs> I'm going to read this again. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Did you get that part when I first said it? Because this is not from his touch, nothing else. It's by faith. He took the blind, and, and just because Jesus has the power, he took the blind man by the hand, led him outside of the village, then he spit on the man, uh, put, he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him. Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight restored. Where am I at? And he saw everything clearly. Looks a little different, a little perspective, doesn't it? And you see, I'm trying to make a point here. What you need to do with your eyes, what you see. Uh, let, let's read it again. Because it comes right after him asking the disciples, Don't you understand? Then they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man. Not the disciples, some people. They begged Jesus to touch him. But the world is looking for a touch from you, whatever that may be. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him outside. It required effort. He took him alone, whatever he did. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. What do you see when you see people? I asked it before in a sermon whenever it was. How do you view the poor? How do you view the thief? What do you see? You should see people made in the image of God who don't know the truth and you've been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Do you have compassion for them as Jesus had compassion for them? <laughs> to feed them physically, yes, but how much more spiritually? Because when you get through, you'll notice that all those collages made up this. You can see it from there. You don't have to get up close. You get the whole picture. I think there's 4,000 images in there. I may be totally off. I don't remember what the number is. But when you step back and truly see the gospel message, you cannot, you cannot see that Jesus suffered and died for you. He was humiliated. His disciples betrayed him. Everything else. And he did that for you because he loves you that much. Will you come and follow after him? Who do you say that I am? That's why I want to do the movie 
Friday so that you've saturated yourself with the gospel mark. It's the shortest one. If you, if you don't spend time on that, why, when are you ever going to spend time studying God's word besides that so you can be an approved workman who rightly handles the word of truth? One of the biggest fears, again, that people have from saying the gospel message, well, I, I don't know all these things. Well, here it is. Here's God's word, and he will reveal it to you. And you also got to know that, that if you don't have the words to say, he'll give you the words. But you need to be studying this so that you know the truth so that you can rightly handle it. A workman approved by God. Rightly handling the word of truth, giving people their spiritual bread. Because without spiritual bread, all of our bodies die. But we live in a tent. This is not our future. This is not eternity. This is not our glory. In chapter 9, what did you read? He took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain and was transformed before their very eyes. And they still did not comprehend. Well, he's got it right here. We have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. We have people relying on us to feed them, to care for them. But you're not going to understand that if you not seeing clearly. So my prayer is, and I'm going to spend just a minute praying and probably lead into some silence, is Lord, please, not only give me vision, but help me to see clearly. Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you for your ways are so much higher than mine. Lord, I do not even begin to comprehend. And Lord, I fall so short so many times, failing to see the eternal consequences, looking at my needs and, and wanting to cry out in my pain, spending more time on my knees and praying to you when there's a problem in my life rather than when there's just problems in everyone's lives, especially those that are hurting. Well, we don't know where the things will go in this world. That's why you told us there would be wars and rumors of wars and everything else. Why not proclaim you while we have peace? Why not proclaim you while we have breath in our bodies? And Lord, when our bodies become frail enough, why not be a prayer warrior if we can't do anything else? Lord, children and grandchildren are a blessing and a heritage from you. Help us to write your words on the doorposts of our homes, the doorposts of our lives, the doorposts of our hearts so that our children and grandchildren see this. Because we constantly say this world is falling away from you, especially in the church in this country. We can't even be, divi we can't even be united as a body, let alone spread the gospel message and care for the poor, feeding them. Forgive us, Father. Correct our vision to where we see it a joy that we deny ourselves, a joy that we take up whatever the cross means for each of us, and a joy that we have following after Jesus, who the one for the joy set before him faced the cross, the humiliation and the pain for me to save me so that I could follow after him if in fact I hear that call and I let Jesus clearly give me sight that he would be separated from you O oh God I, I cannot fathom that again so that I could be made right with you Lord help me not to rely on my own strength or my own means but help me to deny myself take up my cross and follow after Jesus Lord help me to leave this world behind where the only thing that, that is gained for me is dying to save others so that I can bring glory and honor to my King Jesus. Unite us as your people, Lord, to be a light to this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.